Guess I was going to say that, did you? And then we are also going to turn, if you want to keep your finger, in Judges chapter 6. This morning, we're going to see a connection between four truths that the psalmist speaks of and a story that takes place in the book of Judges. So if you want to make your way there to Psalm 119 and find verse 137. I'm going to start a little differently this morning. And then I'm going to start with prayer before we even read. So let's open up in prayer and then we will look at this psalm. Father, we come before you this morning and we give you praise for just how good you are. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for just a reminder of your goodness as we look at the fall coming in and just reminded of changing seasons, Lord, that you are in control. The world may be fast paced around us, but Lord, you continue to sustain the earth and to guide us in your plan. Father, as we open up your word today, I pray that as we look at Gideon and as we look at this, these principles from the psalmist, Father, that you will speak to our heart. Father, show us these truths. And Father, if there's conviction where we need conviction, we ask you to bring it. And Father, if there's comfort and encouragement that we need by your spirit, power to do what you've called us to do, we pray that you would do that as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm chapter 119 verse 137 if you'd like to stand with me this morning we will read 137 through 144 the 18th part of this 22 part psalm and God's word tells us righteous are you O Lord and upright are your judgments your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful my zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish has overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. You may be seated this morning if you'd like. And if you want to pull out your sermon notes, you'll see we have a nice bulletin that we found during the uh, Parsonage Workday, one we've had in the past. If you want to open that up there to the first page, you'll see your sermon notes. And we're going to see four truths here in Psalm 119, and then we're going to see a very interesting connection on how every one of these truths is reflected in a story that takes place in the book of Judges. But let's first of all define what these four truths are. First of all, in verses 137 to 138, we see our first point, and that is that the Lord is righteous and likewise all that he says and does. Notice the psalm. The psalmist is speaking here in the first two verses, righteous are you, O Lord. He recognizes the character of our God. He's perfect. He's holy. All that he does is right and true. He cannot do anything in error. He cannot lie. He cannot do something wrong. And because that is the character of our God, he has complete integrity in all that he says and does. The psalmist goes on to say by saying that you are upright in your judgments. When the Lord makes a decision, it is righteous because it is his character. And verse 138, the psalmist says, your testimonies, that's the word of God, which you have commanded, are righteous and very faithful. So the Lord is righteous, and he is likewise righteous in everything that he says and does. And then secondly this morning, the next two verses, 139 through 140, we see secondly that zeal for the Lord's work comes from a pure love for the word. Now don't miss this. The psalmist begins in verse 139 by saying, Zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. Have you ever gotten agitated when you look at the world around you because someone is disregarding God's word? The psalmist is speaking poetically of that, and we'll see over in Judges where this literally happens in somebody's life. They become very passionate and zealous, almost on the warpath, if you will, to obey the Lord. And then notice the next verse there, verse 140. This zeal is not just mindless passion. It comes from a love of God's word. Verse 140, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. The zeal of the psalmist is rooted in the truth of God's word in much the same way that when Jesus went into the temple twice and he drove out the money changers with a whip, it was because zeal for the Lord's house consumed him. 
He was more concerned with who people were worshiping and that they were missing the point, loving money and stealing from one another within God's house rather than worshiping the one true God. That's what drove Jesus twice to make and braid that whip and then drive the people out. It came from a pure love and a pure devotion to our God. We see thirdly this morning, verse 141. In verse 141, the psalmist is speaking somewhat poetically here, but we will see when we get to Judges that the same language is literally spoken of as an excuse by somebody. The psalmist says, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. He's feeling like he's marginalized. He's feeling like there's not very many godly people around him. Elijah felt that way at one point in time. But the third point that this reminds us of is the Lord always preserves a remnant. He always preserves a remnant. Many times throughout the Bible and throughout history, the Lord tends to work through a small group of people that are dedicated to him. Over and over again, the crowds usually have it wrong. The majority opinion is usually wrong. Jesus, by the way, chose 12 disciples. One of them completely rejected him, sold him out for a slave's wage. And the other 11 ran and hid. And most of them were just common, ordinary fishermen. Jesus did not pick a large crowd of the educated Pharisees. He chose normal people that would serve him. And the Lord used that remnant to then birth the church, which grew like crazy after our Lord and Savior rose from the grave. The Lord always preserves a remnant and uses them for his glory. And fourthly this morning, in the last three verses of this psalm, we learn this. And we'll really dive into this later this morning. But we learn that his righteousness, the Lord's righteousness, is above our own. Notice what the psalmist says. Verse 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. When we think that we're righteous, it's very temporary, isn't it? The most godly or most moral pe person that you ever see on the face of this earth, it's a very temporary thing. It's not perfect. But the Lord's righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth, the psalmist says. Verse 143, trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delight. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. In these three verses, the psalmist is clearly contrasting his own righteousness with God's. That the Lord's righteousness is above and beyond anything that a human can ever attain. That his word and his character are perfect and we are not. Now, if you're over in Judges with me, if you have flipped there already to Judges chapter 6... And we're going to be in Judges chapter 6 through 8 for the most part. But I want to encourage you to flip forward just a little bit to set the stage. Find Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. Judges 17 and verse 6. This uh, verse occurs a couple times in the book of Judges. And it sets the tone for the background and the culture of what's going on. Notice the culture here that is taking place. And as you're turning there... To just kind of let you know where this is in, in the history of the Jewish people. Moses has led them from slavery in the promised land. Joshua has led them to conquest. And they've begun to get their, their feet rooted in the land a little bit. But there's still no king in Israel. And they're still supposed to be battling and driving out more of their enemies and possessing the land as they multiply and as they grow. And this happened over several generations but the book of Judges is about the period of time when there is no king and the people repeatedly are turning away from God. And so the Lord sends judges who are both prophets and deliverers to wage war and deliver them from their enemies. And here in Judges 17, 6, notice the culture that they were living in in this book of the Bible. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The culture was based upon their own righteousness. How did the people feel about how they were living? You see, we're very easily distracted from truth. As people, we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions, and we judge other people by their actions, rather than judging both ourselves by our actions and others. We tend to judge ourselves on the basis of, well, I wanted to do this, even if I didn't fully measure up. 
but we don't judge with a righteous judgment. And so here in Israel's history, everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. Kind of reminds me of our culture today, does it not? Everybody has their own definition of truth. We hear that phrase a lot. Well, that's your truth, but it's not my truth. This is the same culture that Israel was living in back then. Flip back, if you will, now to Judges chapter 6. And let's begin to dive in to this story in Judges 6 through 8 of a man by the name of Gideon. You may know him, you may know the story, but we're going to kind of skim through it this morning. And the first verse we're going to look at is chapter 6 and verse 1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Once again, the Israelites have wandered away from worshiping the Lord. And because of their sin, they experience consequences. And for seven years, they are being oppressed by the Midianites. If you jump to verse 11 through 12, we're going to see that something happens, however. And in verse 11 through 12, the Lord is going to come to a man named Gideon and do something. Verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Orpha, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide from the Midianites. Now let me stop right there. Gideon is in a pit in the ground, most likely, this winepress, threshing the wheat. And what you do when you thresh wheat is you throw it up in the air. They didn't have fans and stuff back then like we use today. But you, you want the wind to blow away the chaff. But he's down in a pit. So the chaff's not really going to blow away very well. And he's down there hiding because of the oppression of the Midianites, trying to hold on to their food. Because what the Midianites have been doing, if you go back up in this passage, is they have been impoverishing the Israelites for seven years. Whenever harvest time comes, they come and they take everything they can. And this has happened because of the Israelites' sin. But the angel of the Lord comes to him, and then notice in verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. And we're going to find out this is not how Gideon thinks of himself. And it is certainly not what he had in himself. But the Lord is going to choose to use a vessel that appears weak and timid and frail for his glory to teach the Israelites a lesson. He's going to show his mercy even though God's people don't deserve it. Aren't you thankful that's the character of our God? Verse 13, it goes on to say, Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So put yourself in Gideon's shoes. The angels appeared to him, and we're going to find out the identity of this angel in just a minute. But the angel has appeared to him and is calling him to valor and to battle, really, is what's going to happen. And what Gideon says is, how can God be on our side because our enemies are conquering us? We don't see the miracles that our forefathers saw. He has all of these things. And what Gideon's response reveals is a spiritual immaturity and a fear. He doesn't understand life from the perspective of the Lord. He doesn't understand that what's going on in his nation is because of their sin. He's so focused on his need. But his need and the people's need being impoverished because of the impression of their enemies is going to drive them to be willing to listen to the Lord. Just like today, it's a hard prayer to pray, but many times people are the exact same as they were back here several thousand years ago. And until we hit rock bottom, we don't tend to listen to the Lord far too often. Until we get to the place where we are completely emptied of ourselves and need the Lord to act in a way that we cannot provide for ourselves, until that moment comes, we tend to trust too much in our own ability. Notice with me, if you will, the next verse, verse 15. We're going to jump down to that one. So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Now, up to this point in chapter 6, we have been seeing point number one from our psalm this morning. We've been seeing that the Lord is righteous in all that he says and does. Even though Gideon did not understand 
why the children of Israel were undergoing what they were. He did not understand that they were incurring the judgment of God because they had wandered from the Lord. And we see the Lord calling Gideon to obey him, even though he's misunderstanding and misreading spiritually what's going on. But now we see the second thing begin to happen, the second principle back in Psalm 119. Gideon says here in verse 15, how can I save Israel? He's recognizing he doesn't have it in himself, but God is calling him to something. If you back up to verse 14, the very last part of that verse, the Lord says to him, have I not sent you? The Lord is calling him to this. He recognizes he does not have the strength in himself, and he begins to echo the same type of language we saw the psalmist say back in Psalm 119. Because he says in verse 15, Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Remember back there in verse 141 when we saw that the Lord always preserves a remnant? The psalmist was feeling like he was the smallest, like he was attacked, like he was alone. Well, Gideon feels that same way. But that's not a, um, it is not an, a, what I want to say here. It is not a hindrance from the Lord working in his life. If you notice with me then in the same chapter, chapter 6, jump down to verse 22. And we're going to learn the identity of this angel of the Lord. Verse 22, and we're going to go all the way down to verse 27. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, this angel he's speaking with. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you, and do not fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. Now Gideon's been a very timid figure so far, and his battle with fear is not over in this story. But notice that when he sees the Lord face to face, he recognizes the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. He labels the Lord here with this altar as the Lord is peace. He goes on to say, To this day it is still an Orpha of the Abizarites. Now it came to pass that same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has. And cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar of the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Now, there's several things in this passage we just read that I want to draw your attention to. The first thing is, the angel of the Lord here was not just like other angels we find at different times in Scripture. This angel was actually a pre-incarnate coming of Christ. Notice there with me again in verse 22. When Gideon's eyes are opened by the Spirit and he perceives who he's talking to, he is afraid that he's going to die because he recognizes he's seen the Lord face to face. And verse 23 tells us it is not just an angel. Because numerous times in Scripture, angels will appear to people and they'll say, Do not fear, but also don't bow down to me. I'm not the Lord. But this was Jesus Christ coming before he ever came of Mary. This happened several times in the Old Testament. Because in verse 23, the Lord said to him, this angel of the Lord was Christ himself. If you would turn forward with me to Philippians chapter 2 for just a minute, we will see what Jesus did when he came and was born of the Virgin Mary. Philippians chapter 2. And this is a very important thing for us to understand because sometimes... People believe that Jesus was created when he was born of the Virgin Mary. But no, he has always been a member of the Trinity. And he has come and he has spoken to his people, even at times in the Old Testament. Here in Philippians chapter 2, I want to draw your attention to verses 5 through 11, which describe for us what Jesus did when he came and was born of Mary. He already existed But he takes on human form for a reason. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Jesus didn't come with might and power. He came as a carpenter in the north of Nazareth in a very small town, probably two to four hundred people. People even said, how can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's this small hick of a town in northern Israel. But Jesus came of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Fully God and fully man, he took on human flesh. Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. Notice verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And back in our passage here in Judges chapter 6 and verse 23, it is the Lord who is speaking to Gideon. So even back here in the Old Testament, Jesus is encouraging his people and giving them his peace and his power to do his will. We also see something of how Gideon is going to fulfill one of the principles that we saw in Psalm 119. Remember that second principle in your notes? Zeal for the Lord's work comes from a pure love of the Word. Now Gideon did not read Scripture, but he heard from the living Word, Jesus Christ. And hearing from the Word of God inspired his faith. It gave him the ability to obey the Lord in his power. It came from love of the Lord that he would then conquer his fear in the power of the Spirit and obey the Lord. And we're going to see him battle with fear several times as we continue in this passage this morning. But he is given a passion that comes because of his love for the Lord. And what a powerful that reminder is for us today. Because Jesus can still take any single person regardless of how fearful they may be, and out of love for Him, He can give them the power of the Spirit and use them as a witness to the ends of the earth for His glory, just like He did with the disciples. He still does that today. Here in chapter 6 of uh, Judges, let's jump down to verse 34 and 35. Notice how the zeal of the Lord is now coming upon Gideon. Verse 34 and 35. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew the trumpet, and the Abizrites gathered about him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him, and he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and they came to meet him. Now this has happened after verse 25 through 27, we read just a few minutes ago, when Gideon has obeyed, but he's still afraid. Did you catch verse 27 a few minutes ago? Gideon took ten men. Now remember he said his excuse was that he was the weakest and the least important of all the tribes. Well, he apparently had at least ten servants. But because he is afraid, he obeys the Lord, but he obeys under the cover of darkness to destroy the idol that is his father's. Because he's afraid of his dad and he's afraid of the consequences of the men of the city. And if you read these other verses that we did not, 28 on, they want to kill him and they change his name because he obeys the Lord here. But the zeal of the Lord, understanding he was talking to Christ face to face, gave him the courage to obey, even at incredible cost and even battling his own fear. Look with me, if you will, at verses 36 through 40 as well. Gideon has already chopped down the idol under the cover of darkness because he is afraid. But he's being empowered by the zeal of the Lord, the power of the Spirit. He's calling others to come serve with him. But notice that he still is battling fear himself because he begins to say this to the Lord. So Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. Verse 38, and it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together and wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Verse 39. 
Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. We see that Gideon is still battling his fear here. And what particularly he's battling with is the spiritual warfare of leading what God has called him to do. Because you see, he's, he's already taken that step to destroy the idol. And we'll see how that was in fulfillment of Scripture in just a moment. But now he's beginning to be attacked in his mind by the enemy. Is God really going to pull through? Is he really going to give victory? There is a spiritual battle that he is going through, and it's literally portrayed in the story here. Let's trace this throughout a couple places in Scripture. First of all, Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you flip back in your Bible just a little bit, and find Deuteronomy chapter 7. This book of the Bible is the, uh, the last sermon, if you will, of Moses, right before he's going to pass away. And he basically reiterates the book of Exodus and Leviticus and all the law, warning the Israelites to follow the Lord and not wander away from him. And yet, just a few generations later, they have wandered away. But he warns them throughout this book. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, Find your way to verse 5. This was something the Lord had warned them about a long time before, and it's exactly what the Lord called Gideon to do. But thus you shall deal with them. This is how you should deal with your enemies, is what in context is going on. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, and burn their carved images with fire. Literally, the Israelites were to go to war, not just against the people of the land, but against the demonic idols that they were worshiping. Now, there is a powerful truth here. If you'll turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, there is a powerful truth in the Old Testament that is taught to us spiritually in the New Testament. When you're reading the Old Testament, sometimes we get caught up on why are they fighting here? Why are they doing this there? Here is a, a principle to help us understand what's going on in the Old Testament many times. The Old Testament literally foreshadows a New Testament spiritual truth. They literally were battling against people in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we're going to see that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against demonic forces. We are likewise called to engage in spiritual warfare, but it's spiritual fundamentally. It's not against people. The things that we see happen in the Old Testament were a picture for us, a foreshadowing literally of what we now do spiritually. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, if you're there with me, and look in verses 4 through 6. Notice the spiritual warfare that we are in and the weapons that God has given us. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. What were they supposed to do back in Deuteronomy 7? They were to tear down the idols and burn them. We are to tear down spiritual strongholds of Satan in the name of Christ. Verse 5, very vivid language here. Casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And verse 6, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. There is a spiritual warfare here. We have been given divine power by the weapons that God has given us to engage in this battle. We are not ill-equipped. Not only that, we are to cast down the arguments because Satan works by lies, manipulation, and deception. That's how he works. He doesn't work by power. He works in the hearts of men and women to steal, kill, and destroy. We are to cast those things down as we abide in the Spirit and walk in His power. And we are to bring every thought into captivity to obedience in Christ. Now this is what's going on in Gideon. He's constantly battling spiritually against the enemy, telling him, you're not strong enough, you're not good enough, you cannot lead the people to victory. And what he does is time and time again, he doesn't really have weak faith. What he does is he takes his questions of faith or doubt or fear, really. He takes them to the Lord, and the Lord will work to help him to take every thought captive and make it to obey Christ. 
Sometimes the passage that we are looking at in Judges, Gideon is talked about as if he has doubt or weak faith. But in context, I don't really think that's what's happening. He's battling fear and he's taking it to the Lord over and over again. And the Lord gives him victory as he takes captive those thoughts and makes them obedient to Christ. Turn back with me, if you will, to uh, 2 Corinthians, where we are, back to chapter 3. And find chapter 3 and verse 5. This is the testimony of Gideon's life that we're going to see in just a few minutes. Paul says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. The Lord chose to use Gideon because he would be an instrument through which the Lord would get much glory showing that our sufficiency is not in the prowess or the ability or the charisma of a leader, but in God alone who by His Spirit can work in anyone's life. Back, if you will, to second, uh, to pardon me, Judges chapter 6, and let's pick back up where we left off. Judges chapter 6, and we left off in verse 40. And God did so that night, and it was dry, the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. Gideon took his fear and his questions to the Lord. He took them captive and made them obedient to Christ. He chose to obey even though he was afraid. We many times do not have faith in the absence of fear. We have faith despite and in spite of fear. We obey even though we may be uncomfortable to do so. In chapter 7, in verses 2 and 3, we begin to see Gideon gathering the army. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Why are there too many? Here's why. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So there were 32,000 people. You take the 22,000 and the 10,000, they're still there. And two thirds of them leave because they're afraid of what's about to take place in this battle against their enemy. And we're going to learn just how large their enemy was in the next chapter. But 22,000, the two-thirds, leave right away. But notice verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go up. Now remember our third principle we saw back in Psalm 119. The Lord always preserves a remnant. He's sending away the vast might of their army, which still was far, far in comparison to the size of their enemy. But 10,000 people is still too many, lest the Israelites be proud in themselves and think that there's something when God's going to give them the victory. So he is going to winnow them down yet again and test them. Let's see what happens as we jump down to verse 7. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his own place. So the test here that took place is they were supposed to kneel down and take a drink of water, and depending how they did that, told whether they were going to be God's chosen instruments or not. And there's only 300 men left. They go from 32,000 in their army to 300. Do you think you want to fight in that army? There's 300 of them left. And notice what is going to happen. Verse 9 through 15. Gideon is yet again going to face a battle with fear. And he's going to choose to let those thoughts be taken captive and made obedience to Christ. Verse 9. And it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, he said to Gideon, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with uh, Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. They say. 
And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura his servant to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites said, and the Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and was overturned and the tent collapsed. Verse 14. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, notice this, that he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. He's still battling his fear, but the Lord shows his mercy. And the Lord provides this whole interchange of a dream and its interpretation to give Gideon the encouragement and the strength and get up and go to lead the army to this victory. And notice that his response in verse 15 was was not just gung-ho in his own ability, but when he hears this, he worships. Which many times in the Old Testament, that means you, you get down on your face and prostrate yourself before the Lord in awe for who he is. He worships God when he recognizes what the Lord is doing through his hands. Notice in verse 22 what happens next. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp, and the army fled to Bethachea towards Zariah as far as the border of Abel, Maholath, by Tabath. Man, they need better names. But they were fleeing, and God set the enemies to fight against one another. The Lord sent confusion in their midst to where the enemies destroyed one another, even with just these 300. And notice what happens right after that, verse 24 through 25. Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize them by the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan, and they captured the two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the wine press of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, on the other side of the Jordan. So God's giving them victory, the enemy's destroying each other and fleeing. And then what Gideon begins to say is, come help us and other people join in the fight as God is giving them victory. And the Lord gives them spectacular victory. Turn to chapter 8, if you will, with me, and look in verse 10. We're going to see just how big the army was that they were fighting against. The text has not told us until now. Verse 10 of chapter 8, Then Zeba and Zalmunna were at uh, Karkor with their armies with them, about 15,000 that were remaining, all who were left of the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. So add those together. There's 135,000 enemies that with 300 guys, with water pitchers and torches, God gave them the victory. The weapons that God gives us are mighty. They're mighty because they are empowered by His Spirit. The odds do not matter when God is on our side. All He calls us to do is obey Him, regardless of how fearful we may be. We learn that through Gideon's example. Through even a remnant, God can accomplish His purposes. But that's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. Gideon had incredible victory, but there is a little bit more to what happens in his life. Find verse 22 here in chapter 8. Now the fourth principle that we learned back in Psalm 119 was that the Lord's righteousness is above our own. Gideon has been used mightily by the Lord, but notice what happens in his life. Verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, after this victory... Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. 
Verse 23, But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Well, he had the right response. But Gideon is going to fall prey to pride. Jump down to verse 27, if you will. In verse 27, what Gideon has done is very similar to what happens back right after the children of Israel have come over the Red Sea. When Moses is up on the mountain, the children of Israel bring all their gold earrings and jewelry. They bring it to Aaron, and Aaron fashions an idol. He fashions a calf. Now, what happens here is there will be something that the Israelites eventually will worship as an idol. But how it actually takes place is that Gideon is not intentionally crafting an idol. What he appears to be doing is he's intentionally crafting a monument. And this monument that was meant to point back toward what happened and the victory God had given becomes a stumbling block. Verse 27. Gideon has received earrings and, and all these different jewelry items of gold. And here's what he does. Then Gideon made it into an ephod, which was a, a robe-type garment the priests would wear. And he set it up in the city of Orpha. And all Israel played the harlot with it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his house. He built a monument that became an idol. How often do we see that in our world today? You know, you think of the Twin Towers, a horrible day when that happened in our nation. But there also is a great amount of pride about some monuments we have built since then. We have phrases, never again. Have we remembered that when that day happened, churches were flooded with people turning to the Lord? But once the threat seemed to be somewhat over and we were winning some victories and sending our troops overseas... Suddenly we became very proud and we built our monuments. How this is never going to happen again. We built a monument that much like Gideon here, I believe, became an idol. And we were so focused on our own strength rather than being humbled before the Lord like we should be. This was not only a snare to the people of Israel who ended up worshiping it somehow, looking at it as an idol, but it became a snare to Gideon and his household. And the story does not end there. Jump to verse 30. Now remember, Gideon had refused the kingship just a few verses before. He had in word, but does he really refuse it in deed? Verse 30. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. After this victory, he does what Solomon does and what David do. He amasses many wives. He turns to an immoral lifestyle, thinking himself above and better than others. He wonders from God's word in this area. And then in verse 31, And his concubine who was in Shechem, which is a very key part in chapter 9, that city, this uh, concubine in Shechem bore him a son whose name was Abimelech. Now Abimelech is a name that unless you have a footnote in your Bible or unless you study Hebrew, you may not know what the text is saying there. But Abimelech was the name of this son of Gideon's. And literally, here is what that name means in Hebrew. My father is king. Now, Gideon said, I'm not going to rule over you. But then he names this son, my father is king. And if you go on to chapter 9, which we won't go into today, Gideon then tries, uh, pardon me, Abimelech tries to then make himself king. And if you jump down to verse 34 and 35... We learn this. So it was when Gideon was dead that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bareth their God. And the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who delivered them from the hands of their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, that's Gideon's other name, in accordance with the good that he had done for Israel. One of the evidences that the Bible we hold in our hands is true is because the Bible does not paint God's people with rose-colored glasses. The Lord shows that Gideon, as mightily as he was used by God, was not perfect. He still struggled here later on with pride. He was not perfect. His righteousness failed, but God's righteousness remains. Gideon had beheld the Lord's righteousness when he was younger, 
when he led in this battle. He was zealous in obedience to the Lord. He conquered his fear when he met with Jesus face to face. He conquered his fear when the Lord encouraged him several times through the fleece, through then again the interpretation of the dream. He obeyed the Lord. He was the one leading the revived remnant of God's people, but his own righteousness failed. And he turned aside to immorality later on. And he turned aside and wandered in to pride. In verse 33, as I reflected on this passage this week, I was reminded of something. Because verse 33 told us, And so it was, when Gideon was dead, the children of Israel once again played the harlot with the Baals, and they made Baal Bareth their god. Things were assuaged for a short time while he was living. There was a bit of revival, it seemed, in the land. But we were reminded of something very important, which our culture far too often gets wrong. And that is that life is not about our legacy, but about eternity. Gideon's legacy was not perfect. His righteousness failed. What really mattered was not whether or not Gideon would have the strength to be perfect and a charismatic leader or a guy that would never falter. What matters is eternity and that every single one of us needs the Lord in our life. If you'll turn with me to Isaiah this morning, there's two passages that I want to show you. Two passages that I want us to see. Because the Lord's righteousness is above our own. And this is the conclusion of not only our psalm this morning, but the conclusion of what Gideon's life teaches us. Find your way to Isaiah 64. The Lord is righteous. He is perfect. He is holy. Every single one of us fall short. We are sinful. We may be proud or we may be fearful, but it doesn't matter. Our righteousness is not enough. Whether we are fearful like Gideon or whether we are very faithful like some of the other characters, such as Abraham, that we see in the Bible, it doesn't matter how good we think ourselves are. Because all of our righteousness, Scripture tells us what it is. Isaiah chapter 64 here, and look down with me in verse 6. There's two illustrations, two analogies that God gives us to help us understand how our righteousness as human beings is far below the Lord's righteousness. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are filthy rags. Now, I won't describe what that's referring to this morning. You can study that on your own. But these filthy rags here in this verse are a very graphic uh, picture to the Israelites of what their sin is in God's sight. But there's a second analogy here in the second part of verse 6 as well. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. We're reminded of what we see in fall right now. Leaves have a very short life. They shrivel up and die, and the wind will blow them off of the trees. That is what our own righteousness is like. It fades. It is imperfect. It is as a filthy rag in comparison to the Lord. That's why we needed Jesus to come. Because Jesus was the only one that was perfect. He was our righteousness in our place. And we have to turn to him by faith alone. If we trust in our goodness in any measure to be our salvation, we are believing a false gospel. Our salvation is not dependent on how good we can be, but in our surrender to Christ. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying this morning. I'm not saying our choices don't matter. They do matter. But it is faith alone in the one who is perfectly righteous that can save us from our sin. Turn with me back to Isaiah chapter 55, if you will. We are encouraged and we are exhorted in Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7, to turn to the Lord while there is time. Isaiah is preaching to the Israelites who once again have wandered from the Lord in this book. And he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. Seek him while he may be found. The Lord calls us to himself. But if we choose to push him away, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow, none of us are guaranteed five minutes from now. If we choose to push him away, 
we are choosing to trust in our own righteousness. We are choosing like the Israelites where we started this morning to do what we think is right in our own eyes. But we are called to forsake our wicked way, to forsake our unrighteous thoughts, and to simply return to the Lord. Verse 1 in this chapter tells us, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. We simply come to the Lord. The buying there is referring to surrendering all that we have. Giving all that we have to the Lord and trusting Him by faith alone. This morning, are you thirsty for Him? Do you trust in His righteousness or your own? I want to ask this morning if everyone would just take a moment with me and if you would bow your head and close your eyes if, if you would. No one looking around. The most important question you can answer in your heart between you and the Lord today is, do you know the Lord? Is He your Savior and Lord? Are you trusting in His righteousness or are you trusting in your own? Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Are you trusting in Him or in your own righteousness? And secondly, this morning, is there anyone here today that is facing a spiritual battle. Gideon was a believer who wrestled spiritually with fear from doing what the Lord called him to do. But the Lord graciously and mercifully gave him the power of the Spirit to obey. And this morning, if you would simply raise your hand if either you are someone who needs to place their faith and trust in Christ today or who is facing a spiritual battle and just wants to indicate that to the Lord this morning. And if you keep your head bowed for just a moment more, in just a couple of moments, Tom and Scott will come back up and they'll lead us in song. But I want to encourage us today. Let's not just rush through singing a song and moving into what we have next. If the Lord is speaking to your heart today, respond to him. Don't push him away. Today is the day of salvation. If there is something that you are battling with, a spiritual war that you are fighting, I want to open up our altars today. You can come and just stand. You can bow your head. You can kneel with the Lord alone. Or if you'd like someone to pray with you, I'll be off to the side. But as Scott comes, respond to the Lord as he's working in your life. Don't feel pressure to sing. If you need to pray, just let Scott sing and minister to you as he and Tom will play. Let's let the Lord have this time. Do what the Lord is leading you to, and if you need to.